All right, I'd like to invite everyone to please close your eyes and take a nice big deep breath. Oh, let it all go. I am here only to be truly helpful. I am here to represent him who sent me. I do not have to worry about what to say or what to do because he who sent me will direct me. I am content to be wherever he wishes, knowing he goes there with me. I will be healed as I let him teach me to heal. Amen. All right, so we've been talking for Larry's sake uh, about the dream, dreaming, the nightmare, all those kinds of concepts that kind of encompass this idea of the perspective from the course of the fact that we are dreaming a dream of exile and we are not aware that that's even what we're doing. So we've been really examining a lot of the sections in the course that have to do with that. So I thought I'd start with just a, a couple paragraphs from text 218, if anybody wants to go there. And these are basically talking about the description of the nightmare uh, from Jesus' point of view. And while you're looking up the pages, if you wish to, um, <clears throat> I always think it's rather cute that Jesus basically tells us where we are, even though we don't always understand where we are. It's almost like he knows we're lost in the dream. We don't know we're lost in the dream. So he's trying to tell us, but I know you're lost in the dream and let me help you get out of the dream. And this is how we're going to do this. But we think we know a lot, but he's trying to explain to us that we don't really. So we're going to start with paragraph number four. And as usual, I'll read through the paragraph and then we'll talk about it a little, a little bit. So remember what was said about the frightening perceptions of little children, which terrify them because they do not understand them. If they ask for enlightenment and accept it, their fears vanish. But if they hide their nightmares, they will keep them. It is easy to help an uncertain child for he recognizes that he does not understand what his perceptions mean. Yet you believe that you do understand yours. Little, child, little child, you are hiding your head under the cover of the heavy blankets you have laid upon yourself. You are hiding your nightmares in the darkness of your own false certainty and refusing to open your eyes and look at them. All right, so the first line, basically Jesus is saying, remember what I said about the frightened, frightening perceptions of little children. And the reason why he said it that way is because um, he's, he's mentioned this concept of the frightening perceptions before. And these uh, perceptions will terrify them because they do not understand them. So we don't understand that we're living in these terrifying, frightening perceptions because we just believe that's life and you've got to deal with it. You've got to do the best you can to live through the process of what life presents it. Certainly don't like it a lot of times, but to really under the understanding of where we are, don't have a clue as to the fact that we're even dreaming or what we could do about it. And I was thinking this week, I wanted to make something very, very clear. And so I'm going to take the chart and kind of cover it with a couple things here. Let's see if I can do this without knocking it over. Maybe I can. Well, let's see. A little more scotch tape. Where did I put the scotch tape? Um, that technically we always show the chart as though it has these four squares, but we don't understand that when we choose to, when we chose to separate, we were given the answer and the answer was nothing happened. We looked at these two choices and we chose that one because we were now afraid to go back to the love of God. So at that moment in our experience, we cut off in our memory the memory of what 
God was. And so now all we know within our mind, and this is not working very well, but we're going to keep trying. <laughs> um, we, we forget that this even exists. And we only know that's there. And this is actually the um, reflection of that. So when that was closed off, the possibility of this no longer existed in our mind either. So we have this thought of guilt, sin, and fear that we believed we separated. We thought we did something horrible to God to exist in duality. We couldn't tolerate the guilt, sin, and fear because if you think about it, we lived in an experience of pure love and oneness and in everything that god gave us but we didn't realize that when we chose to separate we would lose the love the oneness the connectedness and whatever so instead we bought the package of guilt sin and fear kill or be killed in the belief of separation which we couldn't tolerate so we projected it into the world at which time we then forgot that we were the ones that made uh, stand up because that's not going to work <laughs> we were the ones that made that choice so now we literally live in time and space in the concept of the me in this body in relationship to what goes on in the body so when he says that we um, are living in frightening perception as little children and we're terrified of them we don't understand that this was a result of that because literally all we know now is this one little square box and larry was talking about teaching his granddaughter uh, chess and i was thinking how could i make this understanding clear and we know if you're playing a chess game and you have a piece and you move that piece over to another square that piece is no longer in that square, okay? So now the game carries on from the new square. Well, each time we made one of these choices, we closed off the memory of the previous square. So quite literally, all we know from the moment we're born is this square. All we have to work with is this square. All we can make choices, decisions, whatever, all come from this square. And within that context of that square, we play the part of an innocent victim. We know from the moment we take our first breath, as a human being, we literally cannot survive unless somebody takes care of us. They feed us, they make, make us warm, they change our diapers, whatever it is we need, somebody has to be there to take care of us or we all would have died. There's, that's unequivocal. So then we grow up our whole life, <clears throat> play our part from the perspective of I'm an innocent victim. And then we also play within the context of, but I'm also the hero of that dream. I'm the center of that dream and everything else happens around me. And so I'm an innocent victim of circumstances beyond my control. But again, what the course is saying is, we're now being led to an understanding that in order for this to have happened, we have to realize that this is what's hiding or this is what really caused this to occur. And I know I've shared this many times of, if this is the projector, this is what's projected on the wall. So even though I can't see the projector, I'm not aware of the projector, what is being experienced here is a result of that projector. So a great deal of what the course is trying to lead us towards or understand is, you're simply an effect of this choice. This is just the projection on the screen of the film that's in the camera, and the film that's in the camera is guilt, sin, and fear, death, the opposite of love, you name it. That's what the film that looks like on the screen projected out is going to look like. But until we found the course, we were not aware that that was an option. So we lived our life the best we could within the context of this little square. All right, so when he says, remember what was, was said about frightened perceptions of little children which terrify them because they do not understand them. We don't understand the terrifying, frightening dreams that we have. 
or just effect of them. We don't remember that we were the ones that chose them. We, we're kind of stuck with them and we have to do our best we can to survive on planet Earth within that. So if they ask for enlightenment and accept it, their fears vanish. And what Jesus is asking us to question, do I want to find out what enlightenment is? Do I want to find out a, a different way? And we know from the stories of Helen and Bill, they recognized that they were in conflict all the time. And one of them basically said, there's got to be another way. And the other one agreed to it. And for each one of us in some level, some way, we probably had to have come to that realization or we wouldn't be sitting here today. Whether we are consciously aware of a specific moment in our lives where that, that choice was made, on some level, we've all connected with this idea of, you know, the world doesn't offer me what I thought it was going to offer me, and I can't fix it within the context of my ability to fix it. And so that's things, yes. When I call out to the Holy Spirit for help, yes. I immediately feel like an innocent victim. And I go right into uh, that. Interesting. Okay, and actually, um, we're actually gonna go into a, another section when we get done with these three paragraphs that talks about the idea of the power of the ego and the real power. And because when we made the choice to separate, we were making a choice. We thought we were in control. We thought we had power. We thought we were the individual that was special and different. But what we really did was relinquish the true power. So I'm sure that that um, experience that you're having, Jason, is the ego slipping in there and going, yeah, you have to give up your power in order for me to be in control. And we don't wanna give up our power. And that's one of the reasons why we are still very acclimated to staying within the dream. Because we chose to be in the separated experience because we wanted to do something. And I can remember um, you know, the beginning prayer that we use, it talks about the idea of, you know, I, let's see, is it, is it that one? Though? Oh no, the, the atonement prayer where it says, I must have decided wrongly because I'm not at peace and I made a decision myself. And I can also decide other words. And I want to decide other words because I want to be at peace. I do not feel guilty because the Holy Spirit will undo all the consequences of my wrong decision if I will let him. And then the last line is, I choose to let him by allowing him to decide for God for me. And I can remember so specifically when I was introduced to that prayer, when I got to that last line, I wasn't consciously aware of how resistant I was to that. But this idea of choose to let him by allowing him to decide for God for me just did not sit very well with me. And if we go back to a few lines before that, when it says, I want to decide otherwise because I want to be at peace. The question that you need to challenge yourself with, uh, Jason, is when you start to feel that resistance or that discomfort, question yourself if you really wanna choose for peace or you wanna to continue to be in control as Jason. Okay. Okay. And, and, and just be very aware. That but it seems, it seems like a, um, just like a natural or gut response is I, gotcha. I, I call out for help and bang, I feel like an innocent victim. Okay. You know. and, okay. And, and thank you for explaining it that way. Cause I think that helps the clarity of it. Um, but, but also understand we have chosen to be separate. We have lived in that experience for eons of time and the the relinquishment of that is i'm not in control anymore i have to relinquish my control to something outside of me which is very uncomfortable for us that was the reason we chose to separate in the first place because we wanted to be in control and so it's going to take some time before that becomes a very comfortable uh, response to a shift in your mind 
So I would say use that because you're consciously aware of that as a reminder. Okay, look, look at the game the ego's playing with me. Do I want to sit in the ego game or am I willing to relinquish this and give it over? Okay. Do you, do you have to, it's like you have to shore up some kind of belief. Uh, you, you ha it's like you're scraping, scraping off the, the old stuff and you have to, have to somehow, because you don't really believe that, you know, first of all, that there's anything that's going to help you. Sure. And, and yet you'll say it. I mean, that's where the words and, and your intention and your belief all kind of have to like, just hold on, like just hang on for dear life uh, until you, you feel better, until, until peace it is kind of around the edges, if that's possible. Yep. But, but again, you know, when we were with one with God, God gave us everything. Okay. It was, it, I didn't have to ask for it. It didn't have to choose for it. Okay. But when we chose for separation, we chose the opposite. And this is what's been in control ever since. And despite the fact that we're starting just slowly to become aware that the effect of choosing this isn't working very well for us. You know, relinquishing this completely is not very comfortable for us. And as, as uh, Andrea was saying, you know, not a comfortable feeling. But if I want to get rid of the guilt, sin, and fear, death, projection, and differences, I have to be willing to accept that he's got a better answer for me than the one that I've got. And we're not totally convinced of that yet. We're still wavering with that. And that's why this concept of the, the little willingness in any given moment where, okay, in this moment, I'm going to give it to you, dude, because I can't do this on my own. But be very aware the ego's right there underneath that, trying to poke in, bring you back where you belong. Because we've given it that power, not because it has a power of its own. We've given it the power by investing in that thought system. And so that's the, the stronger, um, I'm going to say essence, I don't know if that's the best word, the essence of who we are, because it's what we've given our power to. But it's not real. But to the degree that we've made it real in our thinking, that's the energy, the power, whatever that it has. And its job is to keep you back over here where you belong. So it's gonna, it's fighting for its life quite literally, quite literally. So it's not always a comfortable shift. I mean, it sounds like it should be, oh, I'm asking to connect with my truth. Whoa, this should be fantastic. The angels should come running out from the, behind the clouds to greet me. But it's not the way it works oftentimes. And we don't really trust it either. You know, we got that going for us too. <laughs> it's really irritating sometimes. All right, so we're going to move on to, let's see, line two. If, if they ask for enlightenment and accept it, their fears vanish. So basically, Jason, what Jesus is saying, when you ask for this help, you're asking to have your fears vanish. But we're addicted to our fears. So even having my fears vanish is really oftentimes rather uncomfortable for us. So it's sick, but it's just the way the setup is. And, and again, you know, I've given the example last week, I believe it was if a child is in an abusive home and the, you know, the authorities find out and they want to take the child out of the home, the child's going to go kicking and screaming. Well, that's basically your ego kicking and screaming in a very subtle, subtle way. So just keep working with it to the best of your ability. But if they hide their nightmares, they will keep them. And this is an important line because anything that we hide or will not bring to the Holy Spirit is what's going to hold us in the nightmares. Even if we're not you know, quite ready to grasp this, we're not ready to throw in the whole towel, um, <clears throat> whatever we hold is going to be keeping us from awakening from our nightmares. And what page you're on, Maria? Uh, okay, two, two, nine, excuse me, 218, paragraph 4. It might be into 219 now, but um, what was I going to say? Oh, guess nothing. All right. <laughs> so it's easy. 
to help an uncertain child, for he recognizes that he does not understand what his perceptions mean. Basically what that is, if we were totally in a place of trust and we totally wanted the answers and we weren't connected and addicted as being an ego and we just said, show me the way and we accepted whatever came to us as far as an answer, it would be a very quick process of going home. But we already believe we know something. We, we think we got it covered. We think that I've, you know, I don't need any help outside of myself in order for me to go home. And yet the Course is constantly reminding us that that's not correct. But as we become more and more like the little child that just simply needs help without interpreting it or um, interjecting our opinions, the quicker that door will begin to open. All right, so basically Jesus is saying in line five, yet you believe you do understand yours. And yet how could this, that had all of this happen before that we have now forgotten, how could this know everything in order to solve a problem? And you know, those of you who have been in the course for a while know workbook lesson number five basically says, you don't know nothing. You know, you, you don't have the ability to understand. You're not upset for the reason you think. You know, we're in workbook 79 and 80, it basically says you, you don't understand anything. How could you solve a problem? And yet, from our point of view, not only do we know how to solve the problem, we know how to pro solve everybody else's problem, and we're more than willing to tell them how to solve their problem as well. And yet, we're clueless. So a lot of our progression in the course is to become like little children. In fact, Jesus speaks of that in numerous places in the course where you come as a little child that doesn't know and you need an answer from somebody that does. And Jesus in the course is someone that knows beyond what we know. Not that he's special or different than we are, but he's got more awareness than we do because he's made these steps and gone forward in that way himself. I'm going to read that again. You believe that you do not, excuse me, you, yet you believe that you do understand yours. So we think we know everything. And literally we're like a little child who didn't get a ticket to the baseball game. It was looking through a little, little piece of the fence and he can only see about this much. And he's trying to watch the game and see the whole thing. Well, we don't have the wherewithal to see the whole thing or understand the whole thing. Little child, you are hiding your head under the cover of the heavy blankets you have laid upon yourself. So within the context of the world, I play the part of, my, of the hero of the dream, the innocent victim of all these circumstances that are outside of me. And if it wasn't for them, I could be okay. But in truth, that's not correct. We set it up to make it appear this way, and then we forgot that we were the ones that set it up. And again, Jesus is constantly trying to edge us on with these reminders of helping us to get to the point where we understand that this is a big setup. We're the ones that set it up, but just this, and then forgot, but just the same, we are living the results of that setup. And the more we can understand what that setup is, what it represents, why we set it up, and then how to get out of it, we're going to be you know, living in the results of what shows up in this dream, or in this nightmare, as Jesus is saying in this paragraph. So Marianne, yes. is, is this basically saying um, our ego is keeping us, uh, or our ego is basically saying, Holy Spirit, just go do whatever you have to do. I'll take care of this versus. That is correct. Versus the other side, when you're open to asking for help, help will be there. Correct. When you put the ego aside. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. And be very aware. This, well, let me move this here. And sorry, with the black covering, it's not as easy. But this side and this side are mutually exclusive. Nowhere do they meet. This, there's a line between them. So you're either identified with this 
and you'll have the results of that in the world or you identify with the Holy Spirit and then the, re the reflection of love will begin to show up in your life. But as, as far as being here, you're not going to have access to what the, the answer, the real answer is, as long as you're identified with this. So you're in or you're out. You're in or you're out. And I know initially when people start with the course, that's pretty rough to, to get. But ultimately, yes, you're either in or you're out. And as we begin to understand that being out, I guess we're going to call the ego out, isn't bringing us what we really thought we were going to get. You know, I, I, yes, I, I am still in control. Yes, I am an individual and special and different. But with that comes the guilt, sin, and fear, and terror, and whatnot. And that's going to continue to show up in our lives because the, the, the projector of the opposite is what's bringing that picture to our experience. And the answer is not going to be found over here. It, it doesn't live here. It, it's found by dropping this and allowing him to fill that space with a reflection of love instead. But yeah, definitely one or the other, totally mutually exclusive. And that's why it's so important for us to really understand what the setup is, why we set it up, and then question, do I want to continue playing in a setup that is not bringing me peace or joy any longer? And that's a question each one of us has to you know, filter through every moment of our lives. All right, you are hiding your nightmares in the darkness of your own false certainty and refusing to open your eyes and look at them. And I will say in regard to that last line, we, we have to be very gentle with ourselves in looking at this line. Because literally, as an innocent victim in the world, only knowing this, I truly popped into this world with the belief that I was an innocent victim with no other recourse, with no other understanding, anything else is available. I really believe I'm an innocent victim of circumstances beyond my control. And until or unless they do something different, I'm screwed basically. Okay, no way out, I'm stuck. So this line almost makes it sound like we're purposely as Mary Ann, you know, hiding my nightmares in the darkness with my false certainty and I'm totally, you know, like messed up here. But until we begin to understand this process, we really do live in an experience of I'm an innocent victim of circumstances beyond my control. And it's only when we start to lift these veils and understand what's hiding under them that we can now make a different choice before there was no other choice. I was, I was stuck. But this is starting to open our eyes to that awareness. So when it says you're hiding your nightmares in darkness of your false certainty, you know, think of that more gently as, oh, wow, I didn't realize what the effect of making that choice was going to be. And now I'm starting to understand. And right now I may be refusing to open my eyes to look at them. But as I keep working with this material, the awareness will begin to surface where I begin to understand, oh, I want to look at my, the nightmares and see what they're doing and question if that's what I want to continue to hold on to or if I'm willing to drop it to find out a different way. So be very gentle. Sometimes the words seem kind of harsh. And again, usually when we're reading this, we're thinking, this is who I am. This is who he's talking to, but he's really talking to this up here, where this is the choice for the ego. It was a choice that was made, and the Course is very, very clear with his word usage that it was simply a silly mistake. The results seem pretty extreme in our life, in our experience, but it's simply a silly mistake that can be corrected. So don't add a lot of layers of, boy, am I bad, and why didn't I figure this out sooner, or any of that kind of information. Just simply as a realization, oh, okay, this is what happened, this is what we did. Now I know I can make another choice when I'm ready. So I think there was somebody that said something just before I finished that line, 
Is there somebody had a comment? I have a comment. Yes. Um, I find it extremely interesting that they use the word little child at the beginning of sentence six. Mm -hmm. And what I find is this setup, as you call it, mm -hmm. primarily occurred in my in my childhood. Okay. And relative to a specific event. And okay. then as a result of that event, um, I created circumstances in that were not, I, I made up a dream. Right, okay. So but, that, go ahead. What, what I was gonna say, though I understand where you're coming from and the awareness of that story, understand that this setup occurred before you popped into the world. Okay, so now you come to that point in your life where there's a specific situation that supports this storyline. And, and okay, so let's just go back then. Uh, okay, so here we go on semantics again. So I understand. And, and let, I'll give you that I was born with, I okay. came into okay. this reality, whatever it is, with that baggage. Okay. However, from infancy until somewhere along the line, I don't think that I was aware that I even had the baggage. Correct. Me personally, there was an event that woke up the baggage, if you will. Sure, that works. So I'm, as an adult, going back to that space, I'm behaving like a child. And I am, I'm not taking responsibility for entering the world with the baggage. However, I think that it's important somewhere along to the line to realize that I was the creator of the illusion revolving around the event, which was damaging, much more damaging to me than the original event. Okay. Now the only person, since I am the creator of the illusion, okay. no one outside of me that can fix this illusion. It right. seems to me I need to admit that I've created this illusion, and if I created it, I can correct it and recreate. There is nothing outside of me. You know, earlier you said, ask him to take away the illusion. There's nothing out there. Right. But, but there is the belief in the illusion. So whenever you're connecting with the Holy Spirit, yeah, you're literally right. connecting with the, the other dream, not the dream we have aligned with and continued to reinforce since the Big Bang. So it doesn't really matter what the belief is. The belief in and of itself is the birthplace of separation. Correct. Not as birth, but as the, the son of God who chose to separate. Right. Yes, within the context of this character called Bert, we're going to find specific situations in our life that are going to continually reinforce that I'm an innocent victim, blah, 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 the story, the story, the story. And yet they're all stories. And let's say this is built in in fear. Okay. Now, I wish I had a face, but I don't. We're going to stick a face on that. You know, let's call it mom. Let's call it the dad. Let's call it whatever. You know, my yeah. car didn't start this morning. But the problem isn't the face. The problem is the thought system. And yes, within the context of our world, oftentimes it looks like the face. It, you know, it's really hard to separate the the guilt, sin, and fear from the face that we're looking at, but the face is, is really camouflage to keep us thinking the problem is in the world. There's something or someone in the world that's caused this problem. And, you know, as we understand the course more and more, we oftentimes then take that on as Bert or Mary Ann is the fault of whatever this is. And that's not correct either. The, the character Bert is just playing out what this, this film is representing. 
and then it finds within the context of the illusion loads of different people, situations, and circumstances that continue to reinforce this story of which we play the part, I'm an innocent victim, if it wasn't for fill in the blank, I could be okay. But if all those people or all those situations and circumstances just left you today, all of them, from your mind completely, you would still have the guilt sending fear in your mind because that's where the only cause is. But these people, these characters, these situations have kept us busy for, you know, all our lives with great justification within the context of our understanding of what's going on. Okay, so once I have an awareness to the illusion and, and, I'm, and I move down here um, into the ego state, n n now I am responsible for compounding the problem, so to speak, correct? Yes or no? I would say, I wouldn't the situation say worse? as much as recycling, okay? And, and understand, and the reason why I'm saying that is because, you know, Ken would so often say, you know, this is what it is, this is what it is, and that's all there is. The ego is the ego, and it's going to keep projecting what it is on the screen of life when we choose for the ego. And yet, if we keep playing in this arena, every time we invest ourselves in this arena, we're recycling the arena of this operation. And the answer is not for me to figure out how to solve this problem, but for me to let this go and allow the answer to come forth because I'm no longer identified with this, I'm identified with truth instead. And then the automatic reflection of that, just like the automatic projection of this coming from this thought system will just arise. I'm, I'm getting that an idea that that um, thinking of how to correct an issue um, so that I can't backtrack my muddy footprints through the issue to, hey, to get Paula, to did you go to to go to uh, um, to Anita's today I didn't I just oh. texted her a little bit ago hey, I just told her I'm really sorry <laughs> so I have a water hey, bottle hi Larry <laughs> Larry you're and you're I talking scratching, I hate that color Okay. I'm going to see if I can mute so it. For me in the I, okay. I, I have to think about what I'm going to do. Um, one of my customers is going to want a haircut, and so I told him he can come over. To Sorry about that, guys. All right. I think we got it. Okay. Go ahead, Andrea. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, that's cute. Um, <laughs> I just got, like, I could, I, I feel this energy going so that, that in, um, looking at what we what we did or how we covered our heads when we were kids and were scared um and looking at like what we and remembering how, what happened like how it occurred and you know what all the particulars that um that that isn't the way um it, it doesn't you can't backtrack through it as as an issue um it it's just it it doesn't it won't disappear in, in backtracking through it you, you can't keep going back through it uh to get to peace uh because peace comes when we drop it not when we try to figure out what we did wrong the last time and make sure we don't do it again is that what i mean i'm feeling that energetically like um you know the things that i've done in the past i know that they'll keep coming to tell me things but i see that it's there's nothing there for me to fix um yeah. and i really didn't you know I, I i was i did it in in innocence i i thought it was the right thing to do and 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 it wasn't because i'm not at peace about it it's still coming back and um so um um so that so that the, the, the issue whatever it is um it either disappears into peace by dropping it or it doesn't. And that's all. There isn't any way we can finagle our way out of it. Right. But I would like to add to that, though, what you said is correct. That within the context of the illusion, for those who are not ready to just drop it and align with this, we will go through many 
I'm going to call them contortions of ways where we're going to attempt to solve the problems of the world within the context of a thought system that the answer can't be found. And the course even describes the idea of seek but do not find. And yet that's the only recourse we even understand we have. So we're going to, yes. even though we're you know, even though we're coming to a more intellectual understanding that that's not where the answer lies, we're all going to continue to play that game because that's the, the, the natural flow of choosing for the ego until it eventually starts to dawn on us. I don't need to go through all those steps. And that doesn't mean it's not very helpful or viable when you do need it, but they'll come to a point on the, on the ladder to climbing home where you'll realize that's not necessary for me any longer. So Bert, did you, are you okay with the response there? Or do you have something else? Can't hear you. <laughs> Gotta put your, unmute. <laughs> There we go. Yeah, I, I guess I just participated last week in my men's group, and there's two guys in there that absolutely refuse to take any responsibility whatsoever for the creation of their illusion. Sure. And then I was okay. one of my you know gurus that basically said, until you're ready to take responsibility, you will never heal. Yeah. Um. So I guess I'm always looking for that thing that, you know, like, I don't know where we're going. What do I do? Absolutely nothing. I guess the course says no one's doing anything to me. And then the course says I need do nothing. Yep. But it seems like I am doing something to me. <laughs> I know. It, you know the we, I. Yeah, I know. It, it, for us to it's, really come to the understanding of what the course is offering takes a lot because we're not ready to give up me enough to, right. be able to do what it really wants us to do. So as you said, Bert, we're going to, you know, run around in the world and do whatever, whatever we think yeah. we need to, do to figure it out until we find, you know, and I, I think of the, the story of Buddha who, you know, went all over the world and tried so many different things. And then one day sat down in front of the booty tree because he had exhausted all his ability to control the world and find an answer. And then poof, he came. So we'll, we'll go through whatever we have to go through to get to that point. Yeah, I don't want to um, beat a dead horse here or, or talk too much. I feel like I talk too much. Um, I, I, I would say this. I have regressed, so to speak, to the point of the original event. And I think that you're making a good point that I came in with that, um, which is something that I forgot that I knew. Um, and, and, and you're right. However, so I'm at to the point, I'm at the point now where I take responsibility for everything past that point that I created something. I made a, a monster, a mountain out of a molehill. And now I'm just looking at a molehill. Um, and yeah, okay, I came in with that. These other two guys, they wouldn't even look at the fact that they were responsible for turning the molehill into an amount here sure, sure. there and, was nothing that I, I could say to them nope. Nope. right yeah and and yeah. we've all been where they are yes point where we are now and the more we can just love them and accept them for where they are and where they need to be and not try to puke our stuff on them because they're not ready to hear it they're you're like talking to a wall and and just live the presence of what you know within your life and when the day comes, when they're ready and they're ripe for that understanding, they'll come and find you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, good. All right. I'll mute myself now. Okay, all right, Bert. <laughs> all right, so paragraph number five. Let us not save nightmares for they are not fitting offerings for Christ. So they are not fit gifts for you. Take off the covers and look at what you are afraid of. Only the anticipation will frighten you, for the reality of nothingness cannot be frightening. 
let us not delay this for your dream of hatred will not leave you without help and help is here notice the help the first help was a little h and the second one was a capital h learn to be quiet in the midst of turmoil for quietness is the end of strife and this is the journey to peace look straight at every image that rises to delay you for the goal is inevitable because it is eternal the goal of love is but your right and it belongs to you despite your dreams all right so again be very aware that Jesus is speaking from a place where he's moved totally and completely and absolutely beyond nightmares, beyond guilt and in fear. And so um, when he shares sometimes, he will speak as though, you know, guys, just do this. All done. And yet we're so enmeshed in the thought system and the belief system of the ego that sometimes his words almost seem harsh, though they're not intended to feel or be harsh in any way, shape, or form. He's basically saying, you're in a dream, the dream is bringing you, you know, reflections of guilt, sin, and fear, you know, death, pain, suffering, and all you have to do is move beyond them and choose for this. But because we're so addicted to being this, and we also, continue to be able to represent ourselves as the hero of the dream, the innocent victim, and blame something or someone else instead of taking down that, that responsibility, that his answers just really don't always feed us where we are at that particular point. So when he says, let us not save nightmares, for they are not fitting offerings for Christ, so they are not fit gifts for you. Well, if we could sit above and watch ourselves live in this pond of this most disgusting, gross, dirty water and know that there was a clean pool right next to it and all we had to do was jump over there, we would slap ourselves in the head for not doing it. But because we're so addicted to this thought system, just like the little child that's being taken from a home of abuse, and brought to a family that's going to take care of that child but we don't get that we only know this limited aspect of ourselves so we don't trust that his answers are going to be so much better than our answers so we just go one little tiny itty bitty step forward and go wow look what i did isn't this great which it is considering how addicted to the thought system we are but it's not going to unfold to the completion of our truth until we're ready to drop all of this so we have to take ourselves where we are take off the yeah. yes go ahead so i was asking before about calling out to the holy spirit and coming back as an innocent victim yes um so it almost sounds like um i have to keep challenging myself even after i'm reaching out to the holy spirit because i'm i'm deliberately going to be deceiving myself i have to plan for being deceiving myself does, does that make any sense it makes perfect sense and and understand that the reason why your automatic does that is because we're addicted to this thought system this thought system is a foreign object quite literally and so the job of this is to keep you here and it will use any ploy, any way, any shape it can. So I would say just become more and more observant of that particular game being played out in your process so that you will come to the point when the awareness of that comes to the surface, you can smile at that and go, well, there goes my ego again. So, I mean, I've gotten to the point where I can say my opinion doesn't matter once I've reached out to the Holy Spirit. So I'm not deceiving myself in that way but it's almost like emotionally I'm going into innocent victim. It's not like consciously or mentally I'm going into innocent victim. I'm doing it emotionally. Yep. Well, but understand emotional is, is run by the ego just as much as intellectual and all the other things. It's just another way the ego can pull you in. 
And you know, if we take something as simple as you're on a diet and somebody brings this delicious looking chocolate cake into work and you love chocolate cake, and all day long, the ego is prompting you, oh, you know, you shouldn't eat that cake, you shouldn't eat that cake, or you should eat that cake. And all day long, you're fighting it, you're resisting it, and then finally, you know, it's five minutes before time to leave work, and you go, okay, I'm just gonna have one little bite of that, of that cake. And then you eat the whole rest of the cake that's left there. And then the ego comes and says, oh, you shouldn't have done it, you shouldn't have done it. It doesn't care how it, how it pulls you into feeling guilty or bad about yourself as long as it's got you back over here where it belongs. And think of it like this big, huge, thick rubber band that's so tight it's almost difficult to pull it, uh, pull it open. Well, when we choose for the Holy Spirit, we're pulling that, that rubber band. And then as soon as we let go, it's going to snap back over here because this is what we've said. This is what we've said. This is my reality. This is who I am. And so pulling ourselves away from that is anti my existence. So it's not going to stick real well. And it's going to pull me back and it doesn't care how it does it. Marianne. Yes. Um, the ego is always one step ahead of us. Mm -mm -mm. And it's always lying. Always lying, and it's like, not a friend. That mind. Yeah, it, that, that's helpful. I mean, look what the ego thought system has created. Absolutely. And it uses that to entrap us. Yeah. So if I understand that, um, then I'm more aware that yes. that's what's going on. Yes. Because yes. stuff is going to happen. Yes. And I get to look at it after the fact. I like to think of it as our evil twin and he knows, he or she knows everything about us and will use that against us. Again, yeah. the ego literally is nothing but a thought system, but it's a thought system we've engaged and reinforced mm -hmm. since literally the Big Bang. So it's got a lot of juice to work with. You know, we pull that rubber band, snap it over here for a second which is monumental. If we knew how monumental just doing that for a second was, we would pat ourselves on the back, but then bam, we're right back in here. And then the ego says, oh, it didn't do very good there, did you now? And it's got us by the tail yet one more time. And this is a process that is gonna to continue to happen. And then eventually you'll be able to hold it over here a little bit longer before it snaps. And eventually it'll break and we'll be over here and we won't have to contend with it. But the process to get to that point is going to be you know, what we're going to be playing in. And again, this is called A Course in Miracles. Anything we've ever learned in a course of learning in our life has been a progressive experience of learning something, reinforcing it, adding to it, moving to the next, you know, math, whether it's math or language or whatever it happens to be. It's a consistent process of stepping forward. And in the meantime, I can be kind and gentle. Yes. And if we come to a place where we're much more kind and gentle to ourselves, you know you're making some wonderful progress. Because the ego doesn't ever want you to know about kind and gentle. So that the, when you come to a place where you're recognizing this is a little softer journey, you know that you've made some progress. Definitely. And because what, you you can't second, Andrea, what you um, to get to that point is going to be brutal <laughs> go ahead Andrea or at least in my experience I'll always be I'm you. go ahead and you can't well I, I I for one can't I can't just leave the chocolate cake alone um, the chocolate cake is it comes in there um, ego or whatever it is you know it doesn't matter there's this chocolate cake and there's a part of me that wants to respond to it. You know, other people may have decided they don't like chocolate cake. They'd rather have banana and nut cake or whatever. And, but that's me. It's this chocolate cake is what um, seems like um, it's, it's the, the perpetrator. Mm. Seems like if it just, if it wasn't for that chocolate cake, I wouldn't have to uh, think about it and 
want it and then feel guilty for having it and all those things so that when I actually see start to see the chocolate cake is just another thing in my universe. I could have um, Twinkies, I could have, you know, I could have um, uh, a Mounds bar, I could eat um, Snickers, whatever. When I start to see that that chocolate cake is just another, uh, another thing of the ego, that it seems to have like let some of the air out of that balloon. You know, I'm like, so then I could have a little bit. And so what, you know, then I had a little bit and um, it was, it was there. I didn't, I didn't kill anybody. I didn't hurt anybody. I didn't really do anything. I just responded to uh, what I made of. I'm responded to the ego. And, and so as I not, don't let it be, I don't see it as, as the devil or in my, in my day. Yeah. It's just something and 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 we all have something and the, the, there's more some things where that came from and i can feel myself letting you know the the air is being let out of that uh hard balloon that wants to say here i am and, and and i dare you to eat that whole cake or i dare you to even not even respond to this cake it's just becomes it's become you know just that knowledge um, or that understanding that it's part, it's just the ego has been, you know, or I mean, not just the ego, like it's nothing, but it's, it's just another, it's a thing. It's, it's a something in my mind yes. and, um, other things can come in my mind that are equally different or, or whatever, but I could just not have to, uh, respond. I don't respond the way I used to. Yes. Thank you. Beautiful. And, you know, we've talked about when I was responding to Bert, you know, faces on the guilt, sin, and fear. Well, your chocolate cake can be the face on your guilt, sin, and fear. And we think the problem is the cake. It's not the cake. It's the guilt, sin, and fear that lie behind it. And so as you were describing it, you can now come to the point where you can have a bite and it's not the end of the world because you're not taking it seriously. You're not making this big deal out of it. And actually cake is on the chart as well on the what we would call good side but the cake can be the devil or just as much as anything else can be and and it's something that I think is rather helpful is when we begin to hone in on what are the specific things that really hook me and then spend time evaluating those and getting in touch with those because those are the hooks that the ego can use to pull you in just like that now if you take all of the things that the ego can easily pull you in with and you start working with the ego's gonna have to find some new toys to play with and bring those out but is you know he, he doesn't have to work very hard if, if the same old damn thing keeps bugging me he's got it under control all we have to do is throw one of those you know like a biscuit to a dog here you go go play with that for a while and we all have some very specific experiences that really get us and because we're just recycling them the same way we've always recycled them they're just going to pop right in there got you going and we're, we're gone for days or months or years or lifetimes and it's just one more face on the guilt, sin, and fear that we get caught into and pulled into. And, you know, the course does talk about the idea that as we progress in the course, it won't matter what the face is. We'll apply the same principles no matter what comes up. But initially, we're very specific with everything that comes up and it disturbs my peace. I spend a great deal of attention around it. But that's again part of the process. But the process becomes a little clearer as we keep moving forward. All right, so take off the covers and look at what you are afraid of. Well, we're afraid of the guilt, sin, and fear because we believe we killed off God to exist in a separated state. So we believe in the guilt, sin, and fear. We, it, you know, and then it gets projected into the world of a specific, and then I focus all my attention on the specific, get all wrapped in the specific, totally enmeshed in the specific, and I never know that the problem really lies up here. And the, the 
problem with that is I'm never going to solve the problem here because that's the screen and the movie theater. We know if you go into a movie theater and you don't like the movie, you do not go up to the screen and start hacking away with it with a knife or a thought system or anything else. You, if you don't like it, you would go to the projector and find out what the film is and take the film out. Well, that's literally what dropping this really means. I drop this to find out what's behind it. And what's behind the film of the projector? Light. But we're not ready for light in the essence of that's all there is because we're too addicted to the, the merry-go-round of the party. And we need to look at that and become aware of the fact that I'm still very addicted to the storylines. And even though intellectually many of us are beginning to understand that, watch yourself chase after one of the stories. Or, or watch yourself wake up in the morning and the story's already right there and it's you know eating away at you. Or a word just shows up in your mind that reminds you of something that happened eons of time. And you're back on the cycle of chasing that tail. And that's what the ego's job is because we've given it that job. Its job was, this is who you are, and don't you ever, 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 ever leave this. So when we start to leave this, the ego's gonna up, up its ante and you know, continue to try to pull us back to where we told ourselves we belong. And who's gonna win the battle? <laughs> Only the anticipation will frighten you for the reality of the nothingness cannot be frightening. Well, we're not at a place where we understand that this is nothing. We still attach great value to this being something, something important, something valuable, something frightening, something, something. And we're not at the point where we're ready to completely let that go yet. And yet he's telling us it's nothing. You know, again, what's on the screen in the movie theater? Simply a reflection of the film that's in front of the light in the projector. It's nothing. That's not our experience. So we have to begin where we are, which is, yeah, this one's got me. Not liking this one at all. And there's a whole lot of stories out there we're not going to like much. Ma Marianne? Yes. It, it, it's, it is frightening. And I, as I, as I, the more I get into this course and the more I engage, I find myself doing things that I've put in the past a long time ago and re recycling it as you discussed. Absolutely. And, and, and because I'm so afraid of that nothingness, almost a nihilistic perspective, like I'm so afraid of that nothingness, even though I want that peace and that light and oftentimes feel that intensely within my own being but I am doing shit that I shouldn't be doing. And I know it, and I think that I'm doing it to try to solidify because I'm so terrified it's all gonna go away. Like everything's gonna go away. Like I'm not gonna enjoy anything in this life once I you know, start letting go of this thought system. And that's just, I, again, what the ego wants us to do. Yep. Right. I mean, I feel I, I feel like I'm regressing in some ways because I'm engaging in things that I absolutely should not be engaging in. And it's not anything. It's just I, I, I recognize it. I honestly the good news is, is I've not judged myself for it, yeah. which is huge. But I want to be able to let go of those shiny uh, idols and objects mm -hmm. so that I can make that choice. Yes. And, and, you know, you wrap that package beautifully. You really did because that's exactly what's going on. We're, and, and, you know, he talks about the covers that cover our head and or blank, heavy blankets or whatnot. But, but I really like to look at them as security blankets because when I'm afraid of that, this is my security blanket. And whether we like to hear this or not, that security blanket is offering us a service that we require and need. 
and you know, you're saying, well, I'm doing these stupid things that I know I shouldn't do, blah, blah, blah. Well, if you were at a place where you were ready for only this, you wouldn't do that. But you're doing that because there is a part of you and all of us, not just you, but all of us, it's so terrified of the nothingness, of the there's no Marianne-ness, of the oneness, you know? On one level, our brain thinks, well, why would I be afraid of all that? But the reason I'd be afraid of all that is because I've been addict to all of, addicted to all of this, of which I'm the main character, and that's not very appealing to what this represents. And that's why, to me, the, the concept in the course of the little willingness is so, amazingly beautiful because he's only asking you in any given moment to be willing to drop this which takes you over here for one moment you'll get slam dunk back in here but every moment that you spend over here and then return over here you come back different than what you were before because a part of you is more invested in the memory of who you are and less of you is identified with this. So even though the, the process of this is this jerky up and down, back and forth and craziness, and think about it like cleaning a closet. Say you have a closet that's just crammed, filled with junk, you, you just have to throw something in there and slam the door. And then one day you finally decide, okay, today's the day and I've got some hours to, to give to this. And you start dragging everything out of that closet and you make a pile for the goodwill. You make a pile for, you know, giving to friends and families, a pile for the garbage and then what you're going to put back in the, in the, the um, closet. Well, now the entire friggin' house is a disaster. It doesn't look like you're making any progress at all. And yet in truth, you're making great progress because eventually you'll get rid of each of those piles, put what's left in that goes in the closet away and it'll be much nicer than it was before but literally again we don't have the wherewithal to understand what we're doing or how it's unfolding so despite the fact that the ego is always going to be whispering in your ear oh, you're doing this wrong why are you doing that what's wrong with you you're never going to get this course you know, whatever words that are going to pull us back into the guilt and fear it's going to use against us. And again, we just need to keep you know, picking up the pieces and stepping forward tomorrow and it, doing the very best we can. Those things are no longer satisfying. And I think that I'm reached for things that I've put away in the past because I want to see if they can still be satisfying. Well, and I'm finding that all those things in the world everything in the world whether it's a beautiful and good thing or whether it's something that's not so good for you is, is not satisfying yep and so i i believe that i've been reaching for these things to test them out again to see if i can have that back but you see i have enough uh understanding enough just just a little bit to to that it broke it broke my ability to find satisfaction in this reality yes and i want to have and i have times where i have that willingness but i believe that the fear is what keeps me from having more experiences on that side of the chart and i do want it you know but at the same time you know i just i think the only reason that i've been doing what i've been doing is to see if i can find anything in this world that is satisfying and I, I, I can't anymore. And that's troublesome for me. But, but if you look at that from the perspective of what valuable information that is, you're, you're going back and trying all of those things that used to work and you're starting to realize those don't work. That's, that's taking the air out of the balloon of the ego. Now, the problem with that is you're starting to become aware that this doesn't feed me anymore but you're not at a place where you're ready for this unequivocally. So we're kind of caught in between two worlds here. And that's Ugh. a bit of a challenging space to be in that a bit. It's, it's soft, really bad. Let me just tell you this. But it's almost like if you were work, walking down railroad tracks, only these railroad tracks are not parallel. They're sort of going like this. 
And as you keep walking down that trail and they keep separating, eventually you'll come to a point where you have to make a choice between one or the other. But that's not, a, that's not an easy process. But versus before, where you were lost in this sick nightmare, where you had absolutely, you know, you were truly an innocent victim of circumstances beyond your control with no way out. This is a progression of a finding the way out. It's just that we're still so addicted to little old me, you know? I'm not the hero of this dream for nothing. I paid a high price for that. So just keep working with it. Be gentle as you possibly can. If you need to, you know, try out all those things and see if they'll work this time. Uh, they don't work. They don't fucking work. And I know it. Pardon my language. But I know that they don't work. Yeah. I just, it, cognitively, I believe that they don't work. It seems that. Yeah. I, I, and also, what you were talking about earlier, that idea of perception, of looking through this tiny, but when we get and make that other choice, Yes. And with the help of Christ, we make that other choice. We get to have a bigger vision. We can actually see beyond through this, instead of perception, that's where some knowing comes in. Yes. But other, otherwise, I, I don't know anything as long as I'm stuck over here. Right. And, Is and that right? Absolutely correct. And, you know, my experience has been, as we keep asking, that little tiny hole that we're looking at starts to expand and we automatically see clear what was there all the time. And we're not duped by the ego nearly as much as we used to be. But again, I'm still addicted to this, even if it's, you know, the door is opening and I'm not ready for that. So I'm, I'm in that very wavering place that is extremely uncomfortable. It's, it's kind of terrible, even though well, I enjoy life. And I'm a happy person generally, it does kind of suck. Yeah, it does. Well, but it's... you know what? I know I'm gonna get there. I, well, I believe that I'm going to get there. Isn't this a process of just letting go of our attachments? It, it, absolutely. In fact, there's yeah. a the development of trust that talks about letting go of what you value. Because we value a whole lot here still. I mean, you're sure there's some things I'm ready to let go anytime now, but there's a whole lot more that's still clingy like, you know, static. <laughs> you know? Um, but, but think about this in regard to when you were a little child and the first person that told you Santa Claus wasn't real. Okay? Heartbreaking. That yeah. was, you didn't want to believe it. No, 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 don't tell me about that. That's not true. But eventually you grow up and you realize that Santa Claus isn't really true. And I personally find it quite ironic that Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny are both made up and those are, you know, circulated around both of our main Christian holidays. So I think there's something to be said for that. But yeah, it, it's like, it, it is a process. And, and it's a process where it can be kind of a downer for a long time before it becomes an upper because you know, literally, I'm doing this because I want more peace. And all I'm finding out is, you know, suck is suck is suck is suck, you know. And then I can't hold on to what was I, what I, at least I could hold on to before. Well, you're stuck in between, basically. Yeah. So you're very part, much stuck in part of you. You're very divided within yourself. So part of you wants to be an ego and part of you wants to be with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And then you're, you're, you're tricking yourself, to, you know, in that process. So you're, you're you're constantly kind of like on this treadmill and then the things that you value or you think you value don't do much for you anymore. So you don't have anything to fall back on. <laughs> yeah. It ultimately is good because think of it like when you were a child and maybe you had a favorite t-shirt or a pair of tennis shoes that you just love so much and then they got worn out. But your feet kept growing and you know you could put them back on and tie them and they were horrible and they didn't feel very good but ultimately you have to throw them away or put them up on a shelf or something because you can't wear them anymore so in a way the realization that what I clung to in the past doesn't really work is actually a good thing because you're not going to depend on that to reinforce the ego any longer but again we're so addicted to the ego, it's heartbreaking for us. 
you know, if we were just free of the ego thought system, oh, great, those don't fit, throw them away. What's the no-brainer? But we're not at that place yet. And it's, and it's not about, it's not about um, looking for, because, you know, Denise, I, I can so relate to what you're talking about. I'm in that place myself where nothing is satisfying and, and anger. I, I, a lot of anger comes up over that. Um, and it's not about stopping the behavior because the course is not about behavior. That behavior is all about ego. So can I watch myself get angry because nothing is satisfying here? That's what it's about. It's not about whether I, I'm still looking or I'm still, you know, I'm, I'm grasping for something because I still find myself doing that and, and, and it's not working and it's, it's pissing me off. Me too. So you know, can I can I watch myself do that? Yeah. And and if I can't, I can't. And if I can, fantastic. I think the fear of losing, of of, of recognizing that we cannot, or, or I I'm going to just say we that that we cannot find satisfaction generally from the things in this world. You know, that I've been doing things to run away from it Absolutely. because I'm so afraid. So like, it's like a double layer here. Yes, it's yes. Not only I'm is doing it, the same thing. Yeah, not satisfying, but then I'm doing these things that are not great for myself to run away from, right? to, to hide from it. Right, but you're, but be careful that you're judging, not, you know, judging your, watch, notice if you're judging yourself for that. For I'm, sure I am. You know, the, the the son of God is terrified. Yeah. Terrified. Absolutely terrified. Can I give myself a break for trying to run away from it? It's terrifying. Beyond terrifying. We don't need Yeah, to I don't need I don't even have a concept of how terrifying it is. I so appreciate you sharing, Rose and Marianne, everyone and Helene, so that I know that this is not, this is a universal experience. This is not uh, just my experience. And I'm working, you know, I'm not going to say working or trying, but I have um, not been too judgmental on myself through this process because I, I, I am watching and seeing what I'm doing. It's just I very the hell out of myself. I judge the hell out of, I'm judging the hell out of myself. Yeah. It's, you know, it's just, it's, it's, you know, like Ken says, you wouldn't be here if you weren't aligned with the ego. So what do you think is going to happen? I'm going to be judging like crazy. I have days like that too, where I'm so hard on myself that I feel like I'm just paralyzed and that's not normally like me. I mean, you know my, what my spirit is like. I mean, I'm very vivacious, but there are times where I just beat the you know, out of myself. And I'm sure everybody else does too. It's just, I want to make choice, better choices so that I can choose that other side. Like, I just need to keep asking for help, Denise I guess. Denise can't make choices. No? No. Oh my God, are you going to tell me I'm a fucking puppet again? <laughs> 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 All right. <laughs> Howdy, beauty. Um, I, I want to thank Rose. Ditto what you were saying. I'm doing the same thing myself, Denise. Mm -hmm. Thank you for bringing this up. And I, I want to reinforce what Marianne said earlier about willingness, because, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about this willingness as you were talking, Denise, and I thought, shit, that's what I'm not doing. I'm not willing to let this stuff go. I want to try it one more time or this way, just a little bit differently. Maybe that'll work. And I'm hanging on, you know, like a cat on a limb. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to fall off. And I, there are scratches over everything that I let go of. There are. And mm -hmm. what I learned is that even when I'm calling myself wrong, that even when I'm full of self-hate, 
if I can summon a little bit of willingness. And usually for me, it works like willingness. Oh, I've heard of it. Not there. <laughs> yeah. Now, not Good old willingness. Not yeah. Now, but I am aware of the concept. That's progress. Yes, absolutely. And the mind of Helene could not have even had the concept of the thought of the word willingness rise to the surface if she was totally enmeshed in this. So despite the fact she's still doing the shit and to go through whatever, her mind is not as addicted to the ego as it used to be. So those are the moments we have to be very acutely aware of, oh, even the fact that I recognize or remember that word is showing I'm healing. Even if my ego just trashes me all over the place, which it will, I assure you. I, I think just for me that just introducing the idea that peace is possible, um, that, that I've, so I'm starting to see that, um, let's see, what am I starting to see that I'm, I'm, I'm just starting to see peace as a choice uh, of willingness. And so there's, so then what, what ultimately the Holy Spirit doesn't want to put us in a jam. So the Holy Spirit will, will, will offer me chocolate, vanilla, strawberry, or peace. And as long as I have, as long as I want peace, I see it as a choice. And I'm going to make a more enlightened choice about a more enlightened uh, um, uh, distinction. And I'm going to just have, you know, maybe a little bit of each. And until I'm really sure. Uh, and that probably will be soon enough. You know, and I'm going to share the story of a woman that used to come to the foundation that was a major chain smoker. She literally would light the next cigarette from the last cigarette. I mean, she just sat and smoked all day long. <clears throat> and Ken came up to her one day and he said, let me have your lighter. And she gave him the lighter. And he drew a little smiley face on the lighter and he said, I want you to keep smoking, but I want you to imagine that this smiley face is Jesus and sitting next to you as you smoke, without judgment, without condemnation, without any of that, and just smoke with him. And see, most of us can't bring ourselves to do that because on one level in our mind, we know this is not good for me, that's not good for me. So we're still trying to be in control instead of going, I don't know. I just don't know. And the ironic thing is, no matter what any one of us did, do, will do, ever, we're going to feel guilty about it, but Jesus is going to love us for it because he knows it's not real. We don't believe that yet. So we're the ones that are fighting ourselves always. Uh, um, that is what I am hearing is everybody who's giving up stuff. This is a great sacrifice and you've got to give stuff up where there is no sacrifice. You've got to be at that point and then all this stuff won't be going on in your mind. Yeah. It'll fall away then. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Yeah. And uh, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't quite, work that way in practice because all of a sudden something that you did before that you got enjoyment out of you don't get enjoyment out of so you you have you it's not that you have and that feels like a sacrifice you can <laughs> yeah you know here's an interesting thing to me i think i don't think there's a human being alive that doesn't look forward to going to bed at night mm -hmm. The knower, the knowing, and the known were perfectly willing to give it all up. So I wake up and I say to myself, wow, did I sleep good? And it just seems to me that sleeping is a more natural state than the waking state. So I say I'm afraid of the no thing, and yet I look forward to going to bed at night. Am I really afraid? Well, we think we are. Well, and, and you know, again, that 
seeming fear will come as a result of me letting go of me. And I'm not real happy about that idea. And I guess when, you know, I mean, I think that's a really good parallel, Bert. And if you think about it from that perspective of most of us trust that when I wake up in the, that I will wake up in the morning and I am tired, <laughs> so I'm willing to sacrifice my daytime experience to have that experience. But we're not that willing over here. That willing I go to bed at night and I don't even think about waking up. I just have this sense of knowing that I'm going to wake up. Yep. I don't, so, you know, Marianne, we went around and around about consciousness and consciousness is thinking. So basically, you know, I'm unconscious. Yep. But there is the action. Am I really, am I really afraid of all, afraid, as afraid of all this as I say that I am? And, you know, I have a mentor that tells me, we're all born of stardust, sweep away the dust, and all that you've got left is God. So, <laughs> I don't think God ever went anywhere. Oh, he didn't go anywhere. We went somewhere. Oh, so, but, but it's still in me, and the only necessity is to sweep away the dust. Absolutely. It didn't leave me. I am it. No, I just don't have conscious awareness of it as long as I'm identified with this. And that's why we're constantly talking about the idea we have to drop this to access this. Right. Yeah. So I've buried God alive. <laughs> that's right. You got it, dude. Yeah. I have a friend that um, was telling me that you don't want peace. You are peace. So that's, that's what I'm saying about the sleeping state. You just simply are. No thought required. I'm breathing. My body is functioning. It's a, to me, it's a more healthy state of mind than waking. Well, I would agree with that unless you're having a dream at night, which you're yeah. still attached to the identity of the me. Which is to, to change reality. It so as long as I'm trying to change reality, I'm not accepting what is. Yeah. And there's quite a bit, I can't remember what chapter about, is the bending of the dream. Yeah. I can actually want to bend the dream. But that's no better than the dream. Correct. Right. So we're, this is what we talked about the I'm just replacing one illusion with another illusion. illusion. Yeah. Which is not the answer the course is offering. Right. Yes. Marianne, I wanted to, I wanted to ask you to uh, go back to the lady who quit smoking. Right. Like, I'm, I'm assuming she wanted to quit smoking because it wasn't healthy for her body. Right. But the course is always saying we're not a body, so why would I want to quit? Why should I quit smoking? Why yeah. would it be an issue in the first place? Okay. Probably the answer would be because I believe I am the body and I believe that the smoking is a problem for me. Uh -huh. And, you know, there used to be loads of people that smoked at the foundation when I first started going and they had yeah. a section in the room, you remember, where, I mean, it was just like you couldn't even see the room because it was so clouded with smoke. And, and Ken would always say, you know, people would say, well, why don't they stop smoking? He said, that's not the answer. The answer is heal your mind and then that yeah. smoke won't bother you. Well, again, we're always thinking something or someone else should do something different. And it's really not about, and, and I think that's why Ken was very adamant with this woman of putting Jesus on the, the lighter. He wasn't saying to her, stop smoking. Okay. He was saying, take Jesus with you and Jesus will show you your love. And maybe you'll stop smoking and maybe you won't stop smoking but you'll know your love instead of guilt and fear. Okay, because yeah, because I was thinking if she stopped smoking, which, which she obviously wanted to do, she would have a better dream and feel like she accomplished something. Well, yes, <laughs> until another aspect of the dream popped up and took its place. Yeah. Unless she heals her mind. Yep. Right. And we were talking before, 
you know, the Holy Spirit or the sun is there all the time. You know, in Cleveland, we know there are days that it's so black out that you swear somebody ate the sun. But we know intellectually the sun is there. But what do we identify with? That's, yep. that's the problem. As long as I identify with the ego in any way, shape, or form, it's going to keep me from knowing the sun is there, despite the fact that it's always there. And the Course is very adamant about the idea this is a Course in removing the blocks to the awareness of love. What are the blocks? My identification with the ego. And what does it reveal? The Holy Spirit or love, which is always right there waiting for me when I remove the blocks to the awareness of love. And the process right. of this Course is to constantly recognize, oh, there's another block that I'm holding in front of the love of God. Am I ready to, you know, brush that one lightly aside? Or does that one got me really good this time and I'm not ready for it? Okay, and now I'm curious. I, know, I already know what you said, but I'm curious. Did the lady quit smoking? <laughs> I don't know. You don't you know? Okay. It really doesn't matter, but I'm just curious. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but the point... I mean, it's the same thing as losing weight, right? You want to lose weight. Yeah. Everybody's too fat. So you feel like you improved yourself if you lost weight. You're just trying to make a better drink. And, and well, if the, if the cigarette is a thought, then and peace is a thought also. It's just, I guess, just to think if those are just thoughts is to, you know, readjust the, the power system. It, it, it's, you know, it's, the cigarette's a thought. Anger is a thought. Everything's a thought. And then peace is a thought, too. Yes, and if we go back like to th those are you're you're like losing attachments. So yeah. if I have an attachment to food, you know, I can I can still eat food, but my attachment to food and the food itself are two different things. Yeah. Yes. And the attachment to food is what's going to get me in the course from the course's right. perspective. Correct. Yes. And well, either that's going to get me, or or the idea that it it, it isn't as important as 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 it, that that the ego has me thinking it's important. Right. And 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 then I if I keep asking the Holy Spirit, how do I do this? Well, who? Where is everything? Where where do all the pieces go? Then all of a sudden there's this this part called peace, and it's it's part of the part of the discussion, and. It doesn't have to go be front and center. It could, the chocolate cake is still in, in my mind. Um, but somehow it doesn't seem as real. It seems, peace seems just as real as that. Maybe that's what I want to say. Thank and you. As we keep uh -huh. for peace, but the solidity of our investment in the dream starts to just crumble. This is a very gradual process but it slowly has less and less hold on us. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, one of the, I guess you could call them descriptions of people that have been studying the course for some time is, you know, something that used to upset me or draw me in just doesn't draw me in like it used to. And that thing could still be there, but it doesn't affect me the way it did before. It's, it's, it's having less and less solidity. And, you know, I like the, the image in the movie um, back to the Future, where uh, Michael J. Fox, his, his siblings were, we had a picture and the siblings were kind of fading away. And so it was he because his parents weren't hooking up like they needed to hook up in order for them to be born. And it's, it's, it's uh -huh. almost like that. <laughs> the investment in the world just starts to crumble. And, and it just doesn't have that, that tight hold on it. On us like it used to have and the world can still be doing whatever the world did before but it just doesn't affect you like it did before which is very free very free and you can also be in the world doing the same thing but coming from a different place well, right. which they described as Jesus being in the world but not of the world he walked around in the world like everybody else, but he wasn't affected. He wasn't pulled in by it. And that's ultimately our goal. It's not about throwing away the world. It's about using the world of attachment and learning how to come to that place of it falling away.
and not as Mary Ann picking out how that's going to happen, but as my choice to let go of what I'm invested in to find out what truth is. All right. Let's see. Anybody else? Comments? Looks like not. All right, so we're going to go to line three, paragraph five. I'm not sure that's where we left off, but that's where we're going. Only the anticipation will frighten you. So when we are being asked to look at what's under the covers or look at all the things that can draw us in, you know, from our perspective, it seems like it could be very frightening. He's saying that's only anticipation that'll be frightening. Just keep doing it, and, and I'll show you it's all right. So the reality of nothingness cannot be frightening. So how can something that's not there or doesn't exist be frightening? The only way it can be frightening to us is if we believe it's reality. But he's asking us to look at what we believe is reality, and then he's going to show us that it's not reality. Let us not delay this, for your dream of hatred will not leave you without help, and help is here. And again, the capital H help for the last help is that the Holy Spirit is here and we're being asked to hold his hand as we look at the insanity of this dream that we've held so dear and near to us. And he'll show us that it's not really real. Learn to be quiet in the midst of turmoil for quietness is the end of strife and this is the journey to peace. Well, again, part of this process is learning to still the mind more and more and more in the midst of the chaos that's place on the earth. And it's almost like a stepping down process, for a lack of a better word, from my experience, where when we start the course, we're so addicted to the roller coaster ride of the course. When someone would say, just be still, you know, that just makes you absolutely nuts. But as you keep processing through this and understanding it on a deeper and a deeper level, and you understand that chaos can only bring forth more chaos. It's like when you're in chaos, you're going to bring baby chaos throughout your life experience. But as you begin to become more aware that I can still my mind for a moment, and then that's going to bring stillness babies into the future of your experience. But initially, we're, we're, we're like on the roller coaster ride that's, you know, got the highest peaks and the lowest dips. And we're so excited and, ex and enjoying of it because that's where our addiction level is. But as we keep practicing, those, those you know, curves start to slow down a bit. And then eventually they will go to flatliner, which if you're addicted to the roller coaster ride of insanity, flatliner isn't appealing at all. And yet, as we progress in this, that desire, not because of sacrifice, as Bob was mentioning before, becomes what we want more than we want the chaos. <laughs> and the ego would have us think it's nothingness. But yeah. it's not nothingness. Everythingness. It's everythingness, yeah. yes. Yeah. But again, who's in charge when those words come to the surface? Your ego. But you're right, it is everything, not nothingness. And the ego is always playing the games. Let me find what I'm looking for here. Oh, here we go. Now we think, let me just draw a picture here real quick. Can I add something while you're doing that? Yeah, go for it. I just thought of this the other day. Somebody was saying, and I, and I jotted it down, uh, stillness is not the absence of noise or quiet is not the absence of noise. It's the absence of resistance. Mm -hmm. And that's the other thing that needs to be let go of here. Yes, absolutely. Let, let go of the resistance. Yeah. And, and, and kind of like what Jason was talking about of his automatic response to asking for help was this, this resistance and some form of resistance is going to show up, but it's really reflecting my attachment to the ego that doesn't really want to let go yet. And so we play yep. that game. Yep. yep. The end of look straight at every image. Yes. yes. Don't resist it. Yeah. 
Yes. All right, so if we think of okay. this square as everything, which is impossible to draw a square around everything and make it limited, but we're going to just as an example. So this mm -hmm. is everything that's in the box, and these little circles are our own individual little fence that we've drawn around to make our body, and then the other one for other people's bodies. So when we begin to let go of parts of it it's almost like it's a raising racing part of my fence so the limitedness of me is increasing it's allowing more of the everything to come in and as we continue to erase and erase and erase you don't become nothing you become everything it's just that you let go of your investment in what you have designated to be what you are that you think is something but you're really not losing you're really gaining but the ego again will be whispering in your ear telling you don't let that one go there won't be a you and mm -hmm. there won't be the individual you but there'll be a much broader sense of the allness that we really are all right look straight at every image just like the artist said <laughs> that rises to delay you and what Rises to delay me pretty much everything <laughs> so we got lots of places to practice but the goal is inevitable because it is eternal and we have as much time as we need to undo this process <coughs> it's usually our ego that has a little bit of the course that says you should be doing this faster you should be doing this better that takes us back into the concept of um, guilt sin and fear and we just have to trust that this process is unfolding just fine the way it is the goal of love is but your right and it belongs to you despite your dreams so again from the perspective of this this is our right it's our god-given experience and the only thing that contributed to making the ego was that we wanted to be in charge. We wanted to be special. We wanted to be right. So with that belief system, we have covered over our very essence. And the essence isn't gonna go anywhere. It's gonna remain there, but we have to be the one to you know, slip away the storyline by being willingness to drop it. And, and yes. Um, you know, as, as you were just uh, describing that, that process, um, it, it feels to me so often like the grief process, uh, letting go of self. And I know a lot of times um, when I'm able to ignore the resistance, you know, not become attached to it, something happens, there's, there's a moment. And then immediately following that, there's sadness, there's loss, there's something like that that the ego thought system, I'll say, throws in my face and says, no, 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 you, you, just, lost, you just lost something there, sister. Yeah. Um, and it, it's helpful to recognize that voice for what it is because that to follow that leads me to you know confusion and being pulled in two directions at one time and nothing nothing is happening in that space in that gap in the illusion and and you know just the reminder of the the ego is not our friend <laughs> the ego is anti who we really are you know these two guys here don't sit in the same, they're, they're different. And as long as I put this in front of this, that's who I'm going to identify with. Though this is who I've always been and never will change. But this is gonna slip in and out and slip in and out. And when I do this, the ego's gonna be right there saying, oh no, you've lost, something's wrong. You're, you're doing this, somehow you're wrong, you're bad, you're guilty, whatever, it doesn't matter how that face shows up. And that's its job, because its job is to maintain itself, because we fed it the opportunity to, to give it that purpose. Until we really get serious about, you know, you know, there was a reason that this was chosen, but it's not serving me any longer. 
and, and it's almost like when we become convinced enough that the value of this no longer feeds me anymore, that we really get serious about choosing for this and sticking with it some hell or high water or what presents itself or how many times it whispers in our ears. And we just you know, keep focused like the horse with the blinders on and for our goal. But that takes some process as well. Ariane, what, what Helene just said about the grief process, that's exactly right on as to what, you know, anytime I'm looking at something that I want to, you know, re remove from my life, uh, an attachment that I want to let go of, you, it is a grief process completely. Absolutely. Almost like a death for each thing that doesn't even exist. <laughs> but emotions, yes. the emotions that, that going through that grief process, the emotions can be so intense. And I think part of why I run to other attachments is to avoid the feeling of the grief process of the shit I'm trying to get rid of. <laughs> really? Absolutely right on. And that's why I think this process is for, for where we're sitting such a challenge because we are literally praying, asking, studying, putting into practice the disassemblement of myself. How could that possibly be experiences of fun ride? It can't be. It can't be. Uh, and let me just real quickly go to the development of trust in the teacher's manual where Jesus basically with every paragraph you know, goes through these different stages. And, and he says things like, how can lack of value be perceived unless a perceiver is in a position where he must see things in a different light? He is not yet at a point at which he can make the shift entirely internally. And so the plan will sometimes call for challenges in what seem to be external circumstances. These, cha these changes are always helpful. When, a teach, when the teacher of God has learned that much, he goes on to the second stage, and I re didn't read the part I really wanted to. Oh, all right. The first, they must go through what might be called a period of undoing. Well, we're being in a, a period, you know, that's lifetimes probably. He makes it sound like about 10 minutes, and then we'll be on track. Don't worry. And he says this, he says, first, they must go through what might be called a period of undoing. This need not be painful. Yeah, right. Okay. But it usually is a <laughs> experience. It seems as if things are being taken away and it is really rarely understood initially that their lack of value is merely being recognized. And then he goes on to the second period and, and says it basically a little bit different, but the same thing. And he says, yeah, it doesn't have to be, but it probably will be. And then the next one, and the next one, and the next one, and the next one. And he finally gets to, I think, paragraph seven. And he says, now we're finally sort of getting an idea, but you really don't have a clue still. Well, um, how could that be user-friendly to my ego? It just absolutely positive cannot be. And I think it is helpful for us to be aware that that is part of the process. So as you mm -hmm. said before, and in hearing other people, <clears throat> now at least I know I'm not the only one that's gone through some of this, that, you know, that's the process. And again, that little girl being ripped from her family, that was all she knew, though she was being abused, is painful. Well, can I... Can I yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Whoever that was, I can't, I didn't know who it was. And we can't hear you, whoever it is that wants to talk, I think. <laughs> Yada? I don't know who it was. Yada. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can now. Oh, okay. Uh, I wanted to, to uh, submit another point of view about the ego. Yes. It's possible, it's not likely, but it's possible to say, you know, treat the ego like, you know, we have to have an ego to live in the world, yes. to, to, to navigate the world. But we can get to a point where you can say to the ego, you know, you've, you've uh, done me a good service. You've, I thank you for your service. And mm -hmm. now I dismiss you. Mm -hmm. I don't, and you know, let go. Right. And don't that, find 
or resist it. Just recognize Don't, it. Exactly. And, 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 and let go of the resistance. Just say, thank you for your service. Absolutely. That's very idealistic, I know, but I you know, you need to consider it as a possibility. Right. And I think could about also, Could you also thing. treat the ego like a child? Yes. A child but, with a tantrum. That you can be in this world without the ego. Well, which usually, you know, like everybody that's studying the core, everybody that's a student of the course is of a certain age. That's because you need to develop your ego before you realize that, you, you know, you don't want it anymore. You're ready to dismiss <laughs> it. But you got you to gotta make the ego first. Right. Yes. And that's what we do. We right. got to strive. We strive for success or whatever. You know. But you, but you can't. We work be, hard, and then you realize after doing all that stuff that, well, that's not satisfying after all. Just like Denise was saying. Yep. So. But you, it's not. But you. But you can be in the world. You know, without the ego which is rare yes yes can, yes it can happen yes that's where you say that's where i say chop wood carry water you just do your thing go about your business but you don't get attached to all this stuff and you don't take shit personally you know well, even your own even your own thoughts just don't take it personally just go about doing what you have to do yeah. that's way easier said but. <laughs> but that's that's worth leaving us literally it's yes. possible yes that's for sure all right thank, thank you, you. <laughs> all right so line four let us not delay this for your dream of hatred will not leave you without help and help is here learn to be quiet in the midst of turmoil for quietness is the end of strife and this is the journey to peace so basically what, what um, Beata was talking about is when we can be at peace or at least settle ourselves a bit in the midst of whatever chaos appears to show up in our life, but that's the journey to coming to a place to have a much more peaceful mind where your mind is at peace and it doesn't matter what happens in the world. And again, you know, it sounds good on paper, practice is a bit difficult, but it will take us to that end result if we continue to stick with it. Look straight at every image that rises to, to delay you, for the goal is inevitable because it is eternal. And again, as I said a few minutes ago, it will give us as much time as we need to do the undoing process. The goal of love is but your right. Our right is love. Now this is, this is it. We were given this. We chose this. So this is what we have control over. This is not going anywhere. It can't fix us, change us or anything. It's just sitting there going, here I am, come on home. We have to be the ones that keep pulling aside our investment in what is not real. And it belongs to you despite your dreams. So again, it is you, but the process of practicing the course, this first step is to become aware of how strongly, how much power it appears to have, which is the power we've given it, and recognize how addicted to it we are. Even though it's not real, that's not where we're sitting right now. All right, so paragraph six. You still want what God wills and no nightmare can defeat a child of God in his purpose. For your purpose was given you by God and you must accomplish it because it is his will. Awake and remember your purpose for it is your will to do so. What has been accomplished for you must be yours. Do not let your hatred stand in the way of love for nothing can withstand the love of Christ for his father or his father's love for him. So again, we're caught in this nightmare, but there is a way out, which we didn't have before when we were only aware of the square, and I can't reach up there to put the, the paper back on, but when we were 
here, we had no awareness that there was another way. So this is revealing to us the setup to recognize where the problem actually lies so that we can recognize what I see here is a result of what I've chosen there. And if I don't like what I see here, I can make a choice to find out what his will is instead of aligning simply with my will. <clears throat> so you still want the will of God and no nightmare can defeat a child of God in this purpose. So if we hold true and focus with that is our goal, no matter what comes to pass within the world, no matter how many times we are, we doubt, no matter how many times we fear, we hold true to, I want the peace of God above and beyond absolutely everything. Eventually we will come to that awareness and that place. For your purpose was given you by God. So in other words, you know, God came first. He gave us our gifts. It was we that covered them over with our desire to be an individual and special. <clears throat> and it must be accomplished because it is his will that we be at one with him. Awake and remember your purpose. And what is my purpose? Is my purpose to maintain myself as an ego? Or is my purpose to continue to go back to the place of peace that is waiting for me? And we choose literally in every given instant, which one of those two choices we choose. Before we didn't know that. We're now being becoming aware that that is how that got set up. So now we can make a different choice when we're ready. And if we're not, don't be judgmental towards yourself because you're not. But once we're back with God, we don't have any more choices. Well, there's no reason for a choice. Right. But again, this isn't what my ego likes. My ego don't like that. Your, your, ego, your ego is telling you you don't like that because of the investment we've given in the, and the power we've given to the ego. How could we not want what we are, literally, but where we're sitting, we don't, we're not convinced of that yet. And that's, again, part of the process and the study of the Course is to come more and more to the realization that the will of God is really what we want. But not now. <laughs> not now. But, uh, but in this world uh, today, that my, my ego is, is extremely strong and wants to be completely different from, from everything else and, and also from everybody else, that yeah. I want to be special. And once I'm bad with, back with God, all that disappears. That's it. In a nutshell, Bob, that's exactly right. what's keeping us back there. Yeah. Yeah. And in, until or when we decide the value of that is just not worth the lack of peace for right. us, you know, right. then that's when we're going to begin to choose it. Right. And in the meantime, at least it's helpful to know that what I'm up against, because I didn't know that was what I was up against. I literally thought I was an innocent victim of circumstances beyond my control, and that's all there was. And even though I don't always like to know that I'm the one that chose it, it's a good piece of information. Yeah. yeah. And until here, we're here. ready, we'll still cling to the old, but at least the answer's there when I'm ready to let it go. Did you have right. something here? Thought I heard a voice. I was Go just ahead. giving you a here, here. Oh, okay. Here, I agree here. with what you said. <laughs> you know, like an amen in the yeah. church. Amen, brother. <laughs> and I get an amen. Yes, yes, yes. Please, too. <laughs> so, what has been accomplished for you must be yours. In other words, your 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 heritage as the Son of God is yours. Period. There's nothing can take that away. But my experience can appear to have it taken away as long as I identify with the ego. Do not let your hatred stand in the way of love, for nothing can withstand the love of Christ for his father or his father's love for him. So what that basically is talking about is there are people, situations, experiences within the world that I feel dearly justified to hate. And he's telling us you can't hold on to those experiences of hate and then still experience the concept of love. 
you have to be willing to you know drop or let go of your investment of being right about the hatred that you hold for someone that you made be the hatred hate, hateful thing because of the choice for a separation so that's the whole process kind of packed in that package and i'm just going to real quickly just read the first line of the section we are going to start with next week which i thought we were going to start this week but we had so much fun in the nightmare and the, the, it's in the trust excuse me the test of truth and the first line is yet the essential thing is learning that you do not know i just thought that was kind of humorous but that's where we're going to start next time of uh, the whole idea you think you know but you don't know Okay, so we'll do the same. I'm going to mute everybody. I'll read the prayer. And then after that, I will unmute everybody. And if anybody wants to stay on and chat for a little while, you are welcome to do so. So, okay, so take a nice big deep breath and let it all go. Forgive us our illusions, Father, and help us to accept our true relationship with you, in which there are no illusions and where none can ever enter. Our holiness is yours. What can there be in us that needs forgiveness when yours is perfect? The sake of forgetfulness is only the unwillingness to remember your forgiveness and your love. Let us not wander into temptation, for the temptation of the Son of God is not your will. And let us receive only what you have given, and accept but this into the minds which you created and which you love. Amen. <clears throat> Great. So I will unmute us and...